The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart, and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club. Our topic is the prayer closet, God's protection in tribulation. And the reason that this is so important is because there's no rapture that's going to save anyone from anything. So we need to know now how to get God's protection in the day of trouble ahead. Your speaker has been studying Bible prophecy for over 30 years. He's been teaching Bible prophecy for 19 years. He's the founder and he's the host of the Prophecy Club. He's also a watchman to warn America. Help me welcome your speaker, Stan Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, honey. That's my beautiful wife. And uh, since this is a prayer talk, let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, as I've already prayed, I pray again, Lord. I just dedicate this whole talk to you, to your kingdom, to your people. And Lord, I ask that you would guide and direct everything that I say and do, and that the people would not see and hear me, but see and hear you, and that you would be speaking through this talk to your people, telling them what they must do now to be prepared, to be protected in the days ahead. I ask your blessing, your anointing upon the talk, and that it would go around the globe and wake up many people and prepare their hearts for your protection in the days of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I call this prayer closet God's protection in tribulation. I was recently sent this email, and I want to read it to you, and I want you to see if you agree with it, because I'm going to tell you right up front, I do not. It sounds real good, it sounds real cute, but it's wrong. It says, can you sleep while the wind blows? Years ago, a farmer owned land along the Atlantic sea coast. He constantly advertised for hired hands. Most people were reluctant to work on farms along the Atlantic. They dreaded the awful storms that rage across the Atlantic, wreaking havoc on the buildings and crops. As the farmer interviewed applicants for the job, he received a steady stream of refusals. Finally, a short, thin man, well past middle age, approached the farmer, quote, are you a good farm hand, the farmer asked. Well, I can sleep when the wind blows, the answer the little man. Although puzzled by his answer, the farmer, desperate for help, hired him. The little man worked well around the farm, busy from dawn to dusk. The farmer felt satisfied with the man's work. Then one night, the wind howled loudly in offshore. Jumping out of bed, the farmer grabbed a lantern and rushed next door to the hired hand's sleeping quarters. He shook the little man and yelled, Get up! A storm is coming! Tie things down before they blow away! The little man rolled over in bed and said firmly, No, sir, I told you, I can sleep when the wind blows. Enraged at the response, the farmer was tempted to fire him on the spot. Instead, he hurried outside to prepare for the storm. To his amazement, he discovered that all the haystacks had been covered with tarpaulins. The cows were in the barns, the chickens in the coops, and the, barns bar and the doors were barred. The shutters were tightly secured and everything was tied down. Nothing could blow away. The farmer then understood what his hired hand had meant. So he returned to his bed to also sleep while the wind blew. When you're prepared spiritually, mentally, and physically, you have nothing to fear. Can you sleep when the wind blows through your life? The hired hand in the story was able to sleep because he had secured the farm against the storm. We secure ourselves against the storms of life by grounding ourselves in the Word of God, King James Bible. I, by the way, I do agree with that part. 
through the Lord Jesus, we don't need to understand. We just need to hold his hand and have peace in the middle of the storms. Now, Stan, that sounds real good. Why do you disagree with that? Because brothers and sisters didn't say anything about a prayer closet, didn't say anything about a relationship. And I submit to you that just reading your Bible, memorizing your Bible, preaching the Word, teaching the Word, singing songs, leading praise and worship, teaching Bible studies, does not guarantee God's protection in the time ahead. Now, it's a cute little story. It sounds real nice, but it missed the punch. It missed what I believe, apparently, everybody else in America has overlooked. And I believe God has given me a supernatural revelation to help people to understand what will protect them. Now, I don't want to belabor this point. Uh, this is not a talk to kill the rapture. However, this DVD is. It's called The Truth About the Rapture, and I cover 370 scriptures. And believe me, covering 370 scriptures in two and a half hours is picking them up and laying them down. I mean, I'm moving and motivating, but I'll tell you what, it has become one of the most popular DVDs at the Prophecy Club, and I understand that there was a pastor of about 1,500 people in his church that recently shut down Sunday morning service and played this DVD for the whole congregation because it changed his thinking and he wanted to change their thinking as well. The truth about the rapture, simply put, is this. There is no pre-trib rapture. There is no mid-trib rapture. There is no pre-wrath rapture. The rapture is not going to save anyone. Jesus said very clearly, Gather ye first the tares, that's the sinners, bind them into bundles and cast them into the fire. Then gather my wheat, that's the Christians, then gather my wheat into the barn, that's the new Jerusalem that come down, comes down out of heaven. In other words, when we are raptured, brothers and sisters, all of the sinners are gone. The rapture is not going to protect us from anything. As a matter of fact, those people that say that Jesus could return any moment simply do not know their Bible. I can tell you this. The Bible says, Woe to those that desire the day of the Lord. It is not a day of light. It is a day of darkness and gloominess. You see, the Bible says in Revelation that the sun will go out. Isaiah 30 says that it will get seven times hotter, kind of like you turn on a light switch, and it kind of like a flash, uh, like your, your flash cube on your cameras. It gets really bright, seven times hotter, and then it goes out. And so until the sun is totally out, don't look for Jesus. He's not coming back. And I believe the rapture is going to send a lot of people to hell. We recently were in Modesto at a crusade. One of the brothers stood up there and he pointed out something that I'm going to enthusiastically confirm and check out to see if he's correct. But he said before almost every holocaust, and by the way there's been more than just what happened to the Jews through history, almost every holocaust, the sleeping pill that put the church to sleep was the pre-trib rapture. You see, the church in Germany was told, you don't have to worry about it because for any trouble, you're going to get raptured out. And of course, uh, we had Barry Smith come in, good brother in the Lord. Uh, he's gone to be with the Lord now, but he was a prophecy student for many years. And we had him in at the Prophecy Club, and he told me this story. He said that before World War II, the churches were filled in France and Germany and England. He said, but when there was no rapture, people walked away from the church. He says, and they haven't returned. You see, brothers and sisters, there is no rapture. And the reason pastors teach the rapture is because of their soft heart, which is good, and they want to reassure people, and that's good. <laughs> but they need something to replace it with. And I'm here to give you some good news tonight. This whole talk is going to be about good news because I'm going to tell you that our God is good. Our God is holy. Now let me explain holy. That means through all generations, all time past, all time future, through all time dimensions, he's never made a mistake. He's holy. He's perfect. He's good. And he knows how to deliver the sinners into judgment. And he knows how to deliver the righteous out of the hands of sinners. And that's the reason the Bible says two will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken, the other left. And the one that's taken, brothers and sisters, is the tear. That's the Bible. That's true. Go check it out. Truth About the Rapture DVD. All right, now, 
Before we get into the prayer closet and how God is going to protect us, and all of the reasons why I know I'm accurate in what I'm saying here, first of all, we have to understand what the problem is. What is the problem? Where our nation has fallen away from God. And I'm going to briefly give you an overview of Demetri Dudeman's testimony because I believe that he, similar to John the Revelator, was sent to America to bring them a warning from God. So his testimony is very important. Now, the first question is, should we listen to Demetri Dudeman? Well, I want to compare John the Revelator to Demetri Dudeman, the prophet. By the way, he never called himself a prophet. Matter of fact, he said he was not a prophet, but in fact, his works and his fruits do point to the fact he was a prophet. John the Revelator, Jesus visited him. He had numerous beatings. He was tortured, boiled in oil, banned to the island of Patmos where he was given the revelation warning. Demetri Dudeman had numerous angel visits, numerous beatings, torture, prison, jail, electric chair twice, banned to America, given the Babylon or American warning telling America that she's going to be judged and that she is in fact Revelation 18. Now, now let's talk briefly about what is that warning. Dmitry Dudeman was a Romanian pastor. He smuggled Bibles and remained into Romania and Russia for some 30 years. Finally, he was arrested and put on the electric chair twice. They came to him and they said, Dimitri, come, we want to show you something. And he said, I looked, and he saw a very unusual chair. And they said, Dimitri, we brought this chair all the way from Germany just for you. He said, you tell us where the Bibles are now, or are you going to die in that chair? He said, even if I die, I have nothing to tell you. He said, so they put me on the chair, and they strapped something over my chest. They put something in my ears. They put a bowl on my head, put something under my feet, and he said, now, tell us where the Bibles are. You're going to die in that chair, and they turned it on. I felt a powerful shock going all through my body, and he said, when I thought I was going to die, I hollered out and said, God, don't let me down. He said, about that time, the whole room lit up with white light. He said, out of the light, there was the same voice, the same voice for years that would have been helping him to get Bibles through. And said, Dimitri, don't worry. He said, you're not going to die. He said, you're going to America to give them a warning from God. He said, plead the blood of Jesus. So I started saying, Sinjalulu Asus, Sinjalulu Asus, Sinjalulu Asus, which was Romanian for the blood of Jesus. He said, I woke up on the ground. They were pouring water on me and slapping me around and said, now we have it. Listen. And they turned on the piece of electronic equipment and there was his voice. Sinjalulu Asus, Sinjalulu Asus, because the blood of Jesus was victorious. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Jesus protected him from the electricity in the electric chair. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of the story, and I'm skipping a whole lot of this, because the next day they brought his wife in, and they beat on her some. And then later on that day, they put him back on the electric chair twice, turned the electricity up again, same way, twice, could not kill him. So I think that when someone is put on the electric chair, the angel Gabriel comes to them and tells them they're not going to die, to plead the blood of Jesus, to going to America to give them a warning from God, I think that's somebody that's earned the right for Christians around the globe to listen to what God is saying through them. I think they've earned the right. In my opinion, that falls on the same belief level as John the Revelator. Well, what was said? He was exiled, or actually he was uh, taken home. Three months later, the angel came to him. And he said, uh, in the middle of the night, he said, Dimitri, get up, get up, run outside. He said, I ran outside. He said, there was the angel. He said, do you hurt anymore? He said, no. He said, can you walk now? He said, yeah. He says, okay. He says, get busy. He said, you have four more years to carry Bibles. He said, they will follow you step by step, but I will be ahead of you. I will blind their eyes. When they see they can't catch you, they're going to kick you out of your country. He said, you're going to America to give them a warning from God. He said, so that you know that I'm truly the angel of God, I'm going to tell you the year, the month, the day, and the hour you're going to be exiled to America. He said, he told him, July 22nd, 1984, at exactly 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, for four years, I carried Bibles without fear. He said, I took out the passenger seat. I took out the back seat. I filled my whole, my whole car with Bibles. He said, there were so many Bibles in the car, I could barely turn the steering wheel. I would pull up to the checkpoint. Dimitri, what do you have in your car? Bibles. And they would open up the trunk, and they're throwing Bibles around. What are you doing with all these books? Where are the Bibles? We know you have Bibles. He said, those are Bibles. Ah, go on. Get out of here. Get out of Quit making fun of us. They couldn't see him. They would come to his house with all kinds of electronic equipment to see through the walls. 
but they couldn't see him. They'd be walking on Bibles. His whole house is a Bible warehouse, but they couldn't see him. Now, I tell you the story because, brothers and sisters, I want to let you know, our God can protect us from the beast. Our God can protect us from anything the new world order, the Antichrist, is going to throw at us. We don't have to be worried about the Antichrist or the new world order. We have to fear God. And see, America has lost the fear of God. They've lost the fear of church leadership. They've lost the fear of the anointings, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. They've lost the respect for the church. But brothers and sisters, there's a time of trouble that is coming up to remove the spots and wrinkles from those people so that they might be clean, so that they might go to heaven. So finally, he was exiled. He said that morning, he said, we'd given away everything. He said, we packed up all of our clothes. We're sitting in the living room, all of our suitcases ready to go. They came knocking on the door. Demetri, you have to come with us. He said, okay, fine, let's go. He said, how did you know? How are you all ready? He said, God told us. So they went to the airport. He said, just as the airplane was backing up from the dock, he said, the, the stewardess picked up the microphone, welcome to Pan Am flight, so-and-so and such and such, exactly as the angel had said. July 22nd, 10 o'clock, 1984. That's how we know we have to listen to this message. So he came to America. I'm skipping a lot of the story again. The angel came to him again. He said, Dimitri, he said, get beside me. He said, I don't know what it was, brothers. He said, it looked like a big pillow on fire. He said, but a moment of time, he took and showed me all of California and Las Vegas and New York and Florida. He said, you see what I've shown you? He said, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, their sins have reached the Holy One. And he said, God has decided to punish it with fire. He said, the fall of America will start with an internal revolution, started by the communists. Some of the people will start fighting against the government. The government will be busy with internal problems. Then from the oceans, Russia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Central America, Mexico, and two of the countries will attack and defeat America. Then God will raise up China and Japan and many other nations. They'll go against the Russians. They'll defeat the Russians. They'll back the Russians to the gates of Paris where they'll sign a peace treaty. But they make the Russians their leader. Then, under the leadership of the Russians, it's not that they want to, but God makes them. I believe that this is the hook in the jaw of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Then all of the world goes down to attack Israel. Israel can't count on the help of the Jews in America, so she cries for Messiah. Messiah returns on the clouds and defeats the armies of the earth. He said, now, so that you know that I truly am the angel of God, he said, tomorrow morning at 10.30, someone will come and give you some money for rent. At 11.30, someone will, pay, someone will bring you a bed, and at 12.30, someone will give you a car and a bucket of honey. He said, brothers, it happened exactly as the angel had said. At 10.30, somebody knocked on my door, and he says, uh, God told me you're from another country and you don't, you don't have any money. And handed him a check for $500. Paid his rent. And then at 11.30, someone knocked on the door. God told me to bring you a bed. Can you help me unload it? And at 12.30, someone knocked on the door, handed him the keys to a car. He walked out and opened the door. Sitting on the seat was a bucket of honey. Now, I think that story has earned the right for every Christian every pastor, every church leader in America to set up and pay attention and listen to what God says. I mean, what else would God have to say to get the attention of the church and the church leadership? I think that qualifies. Now, I want to go back and read part of that again because it's going to make a point that is very important. He says, the Russians will bomb on the nuclear missiles in America. America will burn. I said, what will you do with the church? He said, the church has left me. He said, how? Don't you have any people here? He said, people in America honor people. He said, the honor should be given to God. They give to other people. He said, Americans think high of themselves. They say, I serve God, but they don't. In the church, there's divorces, adultery, fornication, sodomy, abortion, and all kinds of sin. Jesus doesn't live in sin. He lives in holiness. I brought you here so you could cry out loud. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Tell them to stop sinning because God never stops forgiving. Tell them to repent. He will forgive them. Now, here's what I want to point out. Tell them to start preparing themselves now so I can save them in the day of trouble. Now, let me, let me talk about that a minute. When I was with Dimitri Dudeman in March of 1988 and I was driving him around 
Uh, the two weeks he stayed in my home, we went to like about seven different churches, seven different Christian organizations, uh, radio stations, a TV station. And as we were driving around, he said many things. And one of the things he told me was a joke. He said, two men ran across a bridge. He said, the first man, he didn't stop to pray. He just ran across the bridge. The second man got down on his knees, folded his hands and got in a real serious prayer. and said, Lord, protect me as I go across this bridge. Halfway across, the bridge collapsed and he died. How is that right in the eyes of God? And I said, I don't know. He said, the first man, he prays all the time. He says, the second man, he only prays when he's in trouble. You see, brothers and sisters, that's your average American. They'll turn to God when they have to. And until then, they're going to live in the world and they're going to continue to build their kingdom. Just like the bumper sticker says, the one that dies with the most toys wins. Well, I'm going to tell you what, brothers and sisters, is not accurate. Tell them to start preparing themselves so I can save them in the day of trouble. In other words, we cannot wait until the day of trouble to ask God to protect us because I'm going to show you that he is not going to hear. He is not going, if you want protection, brothers and sisters, you have to start preparing yourselves now. Let's continue. The angel went on to say, tell them that they must stop sinning and repent if they want God's protection. I said, how will you save the church if America will burn? He said, tell them exactly as I tell you. As he saved the three young men from the oven of fire, in other words, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel from the mouth of the lion, that is how I'll save them. But tell them to stop sinning and repent. Now here's a question. Where were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego raptured? No. The rapture didn't protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or Daniel, and it's not going to protect you either. However, I'll tell you the same thing that protected Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the same thing that will protect you in the day of trouble too. Now, Demetri Dudeman had a series of dreams and visions and angel visits. In my opinion, he was probably the greatest man of God of the 20th century. And I believe, again, he's someone we need to listen to. And I want to read part of them. Now, I realize that part of this is going to be a little laborious, and I realize some of it might be um, a little scary. But it's like this. If I don't scare you enough and wake you up enough to help you to understand the seriousness of what is coming, then you might not prepare. As one of these is going to say, people tend to, just like the parable Jesus said about the, the sower, some seeds fell among thorns, some fell upon dry ground and just withered up. So I'm going to try to motivate you here in the next few minutes to understand the seriousness of what is coming upon the world and that you're not getting away from it and it is going to happen in your lifetime, in my opinion. I believe God has spoken to me. It's going to happen in our lifetime, defined as the next 15 or 20 years, maybe even sooner. Now, Virginia Boldea, which is Dimitri Dudeman's daughter, said that, the mind of man cannot conceive of how bad it's going to get in America before Jesus returns. Now, this is one of the dreams or visions from Dimitri. It's called a flicker of light. I'm only just choosing just a, a paragraph from each one of these. Then the voice said to me, do not be quiet. Tell the people that time is very short and the troubles will come upon the earth. Now, let me just make a comment. You're going to hear that time is very short, but then at the same time, I just said, maybe 15 or 20 years. Brothers and sisters, 15 or 20 years is time very short. You know, I graduated high school in 72, and it seemed like it was yesterday. Okay, I mean, time, if, if you knew that you only, if, if America only had another 20 years and she would be totally destroyed, that would be time pretty short. Do not be quiet. Tell the people that time is very short and the troubles will come upon the earth. I will still allow time for the souls that I want to save. Tell the people that I'm a jealous God and I want them all for me. That's real important. I want them all for me. You see, the average American Christian is trying to share their time. They got one foot in the world, they got one foot in the church, and they think if they attend church on Sunday morning, they are fine and dandy and I'm about to bust that bubble big time. As a matter of fact, before we get down to this, I think I'm going to prove to you that even if you're a pastor, even if you're a song leader, a Bible study, even if you can memorize entire 
chapters of the Bible, you have no guarantee of God's protection unless you have relationship, as in prayer closet. That's your only hope, in my opinion. I want them all for me. Tell them to, here it is, pray more and worship me with all their hearts in holiness and cleanness. Then I woke. That's from Demetri Dunman. A call from war, or from a call to war. This is a prophecy. Cease heading the way you have been going and turn to me, says the Lord. Lucifer is armed for war and his horse horse is coming with a powerful army behind him to take vengeance against the children of God. The day is close, a day of terror, when Lucifer will try to annihilate all those that live a clean life. A day of pain and terror is near. In other words, brothers and sisters, that's talking to us. That's in America, as in the people listening to me right now. It's talking to every one of us in our lifetime. If you could see what is being prepared and what will happen, you would surely quit doing everything that you know in your heart to be wrong and would seek peace more than ever. Be prepared. There it is again. Be holy. And don't give in to the temptations and impulses of the enemy. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Those who will be clean, those who will be holy, I will not forget. I will save them, says the Lord. The armies of the devil are coming against those who keep... I want you to notice this. Key word is worship. Who those, he's, the devil is coming against those who worship me. That's very important. And truly seek me with great fury. Pray that I might give you strength so that before the storm comes, I may save you and give you the joy. That before the storm comes, I may save you. In other words, he's moving us into cities for marked for protection and he's moving the sinners into cities marked for destruction. That's a vision that was shown to Henry Groover. Supernaturally, God will move people into cities marked for destruction supernaturally, he'll move us. Uh, another time when I was driving around with Dimitri Dudeman, again back March 1988, every time we'd pass a river, he would say, well, what was the name of that river? Well, after a couple of days of this, I said, how come you keep asking about the name of every river? He said, well, the angel took and showed me a, a, a wooded area between two large rivers, and he said that in the time of trouble, he said, I'm going to take you and many people here in this wooded area for a time and a season where I'm going to protect you. Now, for those people that might think, well, wait a minute, Dimitri Dudman died a long time ago, uh, like back in 95, 96, in May 5th, I, I forget which year. Uh, so why would the angel say that? Well, because if the angel had said, well, you won't be around by then, then that would date it, and he didn't want to date it, okay? Anyway, those that live in defilement, that meditate upon evil work or on evil things, will have no escape. <laughs> Boy, that kind of blows up the rapture theory, doesn't it? They will have no escape. They will not have my protection. I will destroy Babylon, says the Lord, because of the wickedness and blasphemies of this country. Not only here, but wherever there is sin. I will punish it harshly. Only the righteous will I save, some even out of the midst of the fire. Boy, that fits with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, doesn't it? Again, I tell you, a dark cloud is gathered. Lucifer, standing on his black horses, ready for war. The trumpets of the devil are sounding day and night to all the demons of the deep to be prepared to make war against those who truly live their lives for God. There will be, much, there will be such great turmoil that only a few will escape. Those that today only carry the name of believer will fight with fury against those who worship me with a clean heart. Now, let me talk about that. Let me read that again. That's very important. Those that today only carry the name of believer will fight with fury against those who worship me with a clean heart. Who is that, brothers and sisters? That's Christians against Christians. That's not the world against Christians. That's Christians against Christians. Why would Christians turn against Christians? I believe I have the answer. I believe that when there's no rapture, the unraptured Christians walk away from the church in wholesale in masses, and they get angry. And I said on the DVD, The Truth About the Rapture, that I believe that there will be a time when some preachers that have preached this pre-wrath rapture are going to be drugged out of their houses and something real bad might happen to them out on the front lawn right in front of their own homes. And I mean something like if they're, if they're really lucky, they might only be beat up. But I'm afraid it might be a whole lot worse because... The, this is what it says. Those that today only carry the name of believer will fight with fury against those who worship me with a clean heart. In other words, 
you're going to be hunted down like the Nazis hunted down the Jews. If you are a believer and you worship him with a clean heart. But God is going to protect those with a prayer closet. Continue. This is why I have revealed this to you because the days are numbered. I reveal to you, I speak to you, I show to you, says the Lord. But many who do not want to remember saying to themselves, Is this truly the Lord speaking? Others become scared for a moment, but then they forget and never become pure. Many of those who carry the name of Christian are overcome by greed, fornication, drunkenness, and a pursuit for great wealth. Boy, look at that one. A pursuit for great wealth. Is that not the average American? I mean... Our, it's like our whole nation. The whole objective of most people is to make money. I recently had a, uh, a problem with one of the uh, shower heads uh, in, in, my, in my home. So I called some of the plumbers. And uh, they said, well, uh, it'll cost $269 to come out and repair. And all I had to do was, is, is, now of course, A, I had a company in my house. And, and I didn't have the expertise to do that. And I didn't have the time because I was doing other things with the company and everything. So I was kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Normally, $269 or a tight wad like me, if it costs 20 bucks, I'd still find a way to do it myself, you know. I mean, I'm the guy that, that squishes soap, the old soap against the new soap, you know, and washes out the shampoo bottle. I mean, I'm, I'm a real tight wad. And so it's just great to me to have to spend $269 to have somebody come out and fix something if I can fix it. But I was caught in a jam, and I couldn't get anybody else to do it. I had to pay for it. So anyway, this, this guy came out and was going to repair this. <laughs> and I said, well, so he came out and looked at it. And he said, yeah, sure enough. He says, I know what it is. I know exactly how to fix it. And I've got the cartridge out in the car. And he said, and, and I, can, I can fix it and everything. And I said, well, man, I said, you know, $269 just to, you know, pull out the cartridge, put in the new cartridge. He said, well, that's the minimum we come out for. He says, after all, we are in business to make money. And I thought about that. You know, that's the heart of most people in America. I thought, you know, it didn't used to be that way. Folks used to be in business to help folks. Now they're not in business to help people. They're in business to make money. That's the objective. That's the heart of most Americans. All we want to do is make money. The one that dies with the most toys wins. So they're overcome with fornication. <laughs> Boy, you know, all you have to do is walk. I was uh, just, uh, just today, I was flew in from Portland and had to go through Dallas, come up here to Kansas City. And, you know, in, in about, about three months ago, I made a commitment to the, to the Lord. He gave me a dream and and, and I was asking him, I said, Lord, is there anything else I can do to be perfect before you? And, and I'm going to talk about that. One of the things he showed me is, and, and, and he also told me, this is part of a sermon I gave, to tell the, the men at the church that if they want to be perfect before him, not only do they not look upon women, but they not, don't look upon women in, in a way to get any enjoyment from them. And so, like, ever since then, I've been like... You know, it's like I have to wear sunglasses all the time because I look over here and here's some breasts hanging out. I look over here and here's some buttocks hanging out, you know. And the women, it's like, it's like, it's like they, they, they can't have any confidence in themselves unless they're showing themselves off to everybody. And, you know, when you're a minister of the gospel trying to walk around in holiness in America these days, by golly, I tell you, it's pretty tough. See, yeah, fornication, drunkenness, pursuit of great wealth. There's no time to live. The day of destruction and terror is coming. The devil is agitated and a great deception is being prepared. But I tell you, do not fear. I have the power to protect those who obey me. I think that's very important. God is telling us the trouble is coming. We need to build a prayer closet, but he will protect us. You must remember the word of God for if you will not obey, the day of terror will come upon you and you will suffer together with the wicked and defiled. I will punish all the wickedness of this world and all the sin of this place. Be awake and waiting because if you will not, you will be punished as the wicked and also lose your salvation for your disobedience. Disobedience is punished more than anything, says the Holy Spirit. Pray for your children and stop them from doing worldly things. Tell them that the wrath of God is coming and that they must be prepared for that day. Tell them to read the Bible and pray, there it is again, that I may also save them. 
the great day, the day of terror, the day of affliction, of pain, the day of punishment of Babylon, prophesied in the Bible, is soon coming, and I will only spare the righteous, says the Lord. I forgive who I want. I make holy who I want, and I prepare who I want. Judge no one, for mine is the judgment, says the Lord. Each of you judge yourself. Pray, there it is again, and draw close to me. And if you obey, I will come to your aid. I will send a chariot of salvation and take each one out in his appointed time. Now that sounds like the rapture, but brothers and sisters, that is not the rapture. In other words, he's taking you to a place of protection. This is from Examine Your Heart. Many are those who sit neglectful, loving the world and the things of the world. Many seek the life of the earth, but they do not prepare themselves to meet the Holy One. Jesus is coming. Do not be lazy. Terror and great pain is coming upon the earth. The devil will take upon himself power, and he will attempt to make war with the Holy. But Christ, the victorious one, will come and will save his people. This is from Examine Your Heart. Proud men, all those who pretend to be teachers and never living the life, all those who say they worship me, keyword worship, I want you to hear worship there, with say they worship me, yet their hearts are far from me, says the Lord. I will make them part of the suffering, torment, and terror that they may call upon me, but I will not answer. Those that today humble themselves and seek me with a clean heart, in that day, the heart day, will be glad and will rejoice. This is also saying, brothers and sisters, there is no rapture. Let me read that part again. Those who say they worship me, that's the Christians, yet with their heart, they're far from me. The power of the devil will increase greatly in this country, and many Christians will fall in its change. Because they have dishonored me with their lives and their pride and their arrogance and their vanity, thinking they are holy and worshiping me, yet never really worshiping me. And let me also say, now I know this is a little depressing. It's a little hard. But if I'm not hard like this, then I'm afraid somebody out there might get complacent and fall away. And I've got to drill this into your heart to where you understand trouble is coming. You're not getting out of it. The only solution is the prayer closet. But I'm going to promise you that that is the solution. I'm going to tell you how to build it and also how to know that God will protect you. There's a test. I'm going to give you a test at the end of this so you can know if you're going to be protected in the day of trouble. Continuing with examining your heart. The winds and the storms that would begin against the Christians in this country will take many. Those who remain standing will be very few. You see, people think, oh, well, the white clouds are going to split. Jesus is going to come through on a horse. Not going to be white clouds, going to be dark clouds. And when he returns, if he, the Bible said, Jesus said this himself, unless I return, no flesh will be saved. So when Jesus returns, the human race is near extinction. The Bible says few men are left. Humble yourselves, be holy, seek me more often than ever, kneeling before me often, that in the hard days I may save you, says the Lord. This is from Ready to Begin, another one of his uh, dreams or visions. Awaken, my people, says the voice of the Lord. Be passive no longer. Draw closer today more than ever, for the day of my vengeance is ready to begin. I will shake the earth from its foundation, and I will require punishment of all those that say they do my will, yet through what they do, they blaspheme my name. I will punish prophets, preachers, singers, and all those who serve me or who do a work, yet they do it for their own glory. Now, time out. Wait a minute. Is that saying, brothers and sisters, that we can be a preacher, that we can be winning souls, that we can be doing a radio program, a TV program, we can be teaching Sunday school, all kinds of wonderful good works, but if we're doing it for our own glory, he's going to punish us. Boy, that's pretty hard, isn't it? Now think about it though. See, he not only knows what we do, but he knows why we do it. He knows the reins of the heart. They say they serve me. I will judge and punish the entire world. Only those that today, notice that, not then, only those that today sit at my feet in meekness, weeping and worshiping me, asking for my help, will rejoice in the protection of the arm of the Lord on that day. You know, I have spent many a night weeping and praying and crying out for the sins in this nation, crying out, asking God to give me a way. I mean, I was just in San Francisco about seven days ago, as a matter of fact, driving through Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the sins of this city. As a matter of fact, we're driving through. I'm sitting next to me uh, is, is Prophet Tom Deckard. He said, you know, the very first vision I ever had was when God took me in the spirit. An angel took me in a spirit up to a high place looking over the city of San Francisco. And he said, the sin of San Francisco has exceeded the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet we think, see, here's our problem. We look around, we see the flesh. But brothers and sisters, if we could only like put on some kind of special sunglasses where we could see past the flesh, if we could see the sins on everybody we walked past, we would be appalled at what we would see. I just did a crusade in Modesto uh, last weekend and then just this past weekend, in other words, two weekends in a row, one in Modesto and one in Portland, and Leslie talked pretty harshly to him about sin. Sin of the church, brothers and sisters. And she talked about sexual sins. Women came up and the women ministers prayed with them. Me and Tom Deckard prayed with the men. We asked them to come up and tell us what they wanted prayer for. You would not believe some of the filth that I was told that Christians are doing. Pornography. I don't even want to say it. I don't even want to say the, the filth that Christians told me just day before yesterday that they're doing and they call themselves a Christian. They asked me to pray for it. Say, so I'll pray for it. You better get rid of it, brother. Continue with ready to begin. Change your hearts, my people. Today, for the days are numbered until I will begin to avenge my eye sees in the light as well as in the darkness, my people. There is nowhere you can hide from the eye of God, liars, imposters, those that are covetous, and all those who only have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. I will judge them, and I will judge the whole world. I will shake it from its foundations. In many places there will be massacres. Those that today, here it is again, worship me with faithfulness will be the only one protected in that day. The horn is ready to sound for the start of the battle. The days are numbered until you hear the sound when the armies of heaven will begin the battle against the inhabitants of earth. Again from ready to begin. No army in the world will be able to stand against the armies of heaven and the army of hell will not be able to raise its head against the Lord's army. Yet those that worshipped me, past tense, those that worshipped me, in other words, those that worship me now, worshipped me in, in spirit and in truth, I will protect for I am God. Everything you see around you will be no more. Everything will be destroyed in burning fire. Do not be passive. Draw close to me, for I come to avenge and fulfill all that was said in the past, says the Lord. Just being a typical Christian, brothers and sisters, means you are probably going to be tested harshly. Now from the beast strikes. Just a few more of these and then we'll get to the prayer closet. The beast strikes. They live a life as their hearts desire with their hands stained in blood, in adultery, in sodomy, and worshiping strange and foreign gods. Because they have forsaken the true God, He has allowed them to go as their hearts desired. Now tell them, cry out. Now let me point out. You see, they've worshiped strange and foreign gods. And brothers and sisters, I hate to say this, but I believe He's talking about the church. Not just the, the world. We tend to want to think, oh, well, that's people that are not even Christians. No, I think He's talking to Christians here. Tell them to stop treating, treating. Tell them to start treading the path of their heart's desire. To repent with all their hearts that in the day of the beast's anger I will be able to save them. So they would not deny me. You know what that's saying? That's saying that there is going to be some brothers and Christians, Christians, brothers and sisters that are Christians today, that in the hard day will deny his name. I believe that almost every Christian in America today will have the opportunity, if they live there three score and ten, to deny Jesus. I believe we will be, I mean, I think there's going to be some guillotines, there's going to be some scimitars, there's going to be some firing squads, there's going to be some torture chambers that we're going to have to go through. And we better know our Lord. And by the way, that's, just, that's not just Bible memorization. Bible memorization will not do it. You have to know who wrote those words, not just memorize the words. 
The time is very short, and the army of their salvation is already prepared. Now, this is from a different one. Sanctify you and yours. As for my children, those who have, here, here it is again, worshipped me with all their hearts, I will fight before them, and I will give them victory and safety. I will separate those who have worshipped me from those who have not, as I separated Goshen and Egypt. Now, this is from a different dream here. He says, I am the protector of America. America's sin has reached God. He will allow this destruction for he can no longer stand such wickedness. God, however, still has people that worship him with a clean heart as they do his work. He has prepared a heavenly army to save these people. As I looked, a great army, well armed and dressed in white, appeared before me. Do you see that? The angel said, this army will go to battle to save my chosen ones. Then the difference between the godly and the ungodly will be evident. Now, how do we get God's protection? And how can we know that we have it? Well, here's how it began with me. I just, by the way, I didn't read a book on the prayer closet. <laughs> I didn't hear a sermon on it. I didn't see a video on it. Nobody talked to me about it. Nobody came to me and said, you know, Stan, you really need to have a prayer closet. As a matter of fact, as close as I could say it probably came was when, in 1988, when I was those two weeks with Demetri Dudeman, one morning, he uh, sent Michael over, knocked on my hotel room door, and asked me to come over and pray with him. We all three got on our knees, and before we left the hotel room, and we prayed. It wasn't a long prayer. I'd say it's under two minutes. But Dimitri was a praying man. I mean, he got on his knees. I know, at least twice a day, probably three times a day. He walked and talked with God. So anyway, God began to lay this on my heart that I needed to have a prayer closet. I needed to, 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 to form, well, a prayer closet. Matthew 6, 6 says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Now here's the scripture that he really laid on my heart. Daniel 6, 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into the house and his, his windows being opened in his chamber. Toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And I thought, you know, you, you said, Lord, that Daniel was greatly beloved. And I thought, Lord, you know, I want to be greatly beloved. I thought, you know, maybe I should do that too. Maybe I should start getting on my knees and praying every day. Now, don't get me wrong. I already prayed. I mean, if we had a, have a prayer card, there's a lot of things we pray for every day here at the Prophecy Club. We would come up here, as a matter of fact, right here on this very stage. And I would pray, all the people out there pray every day. We have a long list of, on our prayer card, things that we pray for. Then we come together, we pray, we have a sword, we run it through the head of a rubber snake. We do all kinds of prophetic acts. I mean, we blow shofars, uh, a lot of things that we pray for to kick the, the tail of the devil. But God said that's not enough. And I thought, man, something else? And so I just purposed in my heart that I was going to build a prayer closet. And so, Daniel 3.23 says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell, fell down in the midst, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he said, Lo, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the, fourth, and the fourth is like the Son of God. You see, brothers and sisters, what protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the prayer closet. What protected Daniel from the mouth of the lion was the prayer closet. He got on his knees three times a day and he prayed. And also, let me point out that Jesus had a prayer closet. Matthew 14, 23 says that Jesus went up to a mountain apart to pray before he walked on the sea. Before Jesus walked on the water, he was in a prayer closet. <laughs> Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 135 said that Jesus departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And then in Mark 142, a few scriptures later, he prayed for a man and the leprosy departed. In other words, before he healed the sick, before he walked on water, he was in his prayer closet. Before he prayed for the man where they uncovered the roof and they let him down, he was in the prayer closet. Before he said, thy sins be forgiven thee, he was in the prayer closet. Luke 6, 12, again, Jesus. And it came to pass in those days 
that he went into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now, I've got a question. I've been to Mount Tabor. I've been up on top of Mount Tabor now two or three times. And I can tell you that it is a good, hard one-day trek if you don't have a backpack and you're really, really in good shape. And if you, if you are just trying to make it as fast as you can. And you might not make it in one day. It is probably a two, or more realistically, a three-day walk up there. It took us probably an hour to get up there with a, with a bus. Now, does it make sense that you're going to spend two or three days walking up to get to the top of a mountain to say a thank you for this food prayer? No. He went up there and fell on his face before God. He was in a prayer closet. It says that he prayed all night long in prayer. That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of relationship where it's not just going and, and treating God like a slot machine, saying, well, God, here's what I need. I'm talking about some serious relationship prayer with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he went up to the mountain and prayed, continued all night long. Then he chose the, the 12 apostles. Before Jesus did just about every major miracle, if you'll go check it out, you'll find that first he was in the prayer closet. Luke 9, 28 says, And it came to pass about the eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up to a mountain to pray. And that's the Mount of Transfiguration. I've been there too. And again, that takes a couple of days to get up there also. You're not going to go two or three days up a prayer or up a, up a mountain unless it's a pretty serious, long-lasting prayer. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. Now, is that telling us that if we're in our prayer closet that we receive supernatural power? I believe so. He went on to say, They saw his glory, and the two men stood with him. He went on to say, There came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Brothers and sisters, that's what should be happening in our prayer closet too. We should be hearing God talk to us. Now, maybe it's a still small voice, but Dimitri said that the angel told him that in the time of trouble that he would begin to speak to all of his children the way he speaks to Dimitri now. In other words, when we start building that prayer closet experience, I believe that we're going to see more and more people move from just the still small voice to getting dreams and visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Uh, Joel 2.28. And then you're also going to get angel visits. So I think it's going to be a time of great supernatural battle against good and evil. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, sit here while I go and pray yonder. Now, why did he say sit here? Why didn't he say, guys, come on over here. Hey, let's hold hands. Let's get in a circle here and let's pray because I'm about to go to the cross. Because brothers and sisters, that's not a prayer closet. What he had to say is, look, you stay here I'm going to go way over there where you can't hear me. And I'm going to get alone with the Father and I'm going to pray because I know I only have a few hours to live. Someone once said, is there any other way to go to heaven other than Jesus? I like this answer. If there was any other way, when Jesus prayed to the Father three times and each time the Father said, no, you have to do it. If there was any other way, he wouldn't have put his son on the cross. If there was any other way, there is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by him. So he said, sit here while I go and pray yonder. Now then the next scripture, Matthew 26, 39, says that he fell on his face and prayed. That's one of the keys of a true prayer closet. You get away from any other distractions, any other interruptions, no, a place where no one's going to interrupt you, no TV in the background, no radio, nothing. It's a quiet place. And he fell on his face and he prayed. And that's a key. And in my opinion, your prayer closet is going to be a place where you can be on your knees or on your face before your God. It does not qualify to be driving down the road, going to or from work, something like that. Matthew 26, 44 says, And he prayed the third time, saying the same words. So that's a pretty serious prayer closet. Matter of fact, about uh, three and a half months ago, I was at the Garden of Gethsemane. I was praying at the same olive trees 
They know that without a doubt, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the only olive grove in that area that would even qualify for it. And even the people there say they believe that these are the very olive trees that were alive when Jesus was there praying. And they say, at the very least, if they're not the very olive trees, they're descendants of those olive trees. And I was there, and I got down on my face in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I prayed to my God. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Another scripture saying that if we have a prayer closet, God is going to protect us. Now, let's look at this one. Matthew, nine, Matthew excuse me, Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, what does that mean? He that dwelleth in the secret place. What is the secret place? Brothers and sisters, it's a prayer closet. Now, notice it doesn't say, he that visiteth the secret place. <laughs> We have to dwell there. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Notice it didn't say rapture. You can't count on the rapture. Matter of fact, to the contrary, you can count on it not to be there. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. By the way, that noisome pestilence, could that be the bird flu? Hmm. any flu. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now what does that mean, his truth? In other words, it means that we follow his laws, follow his commandments. We tell the truth. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. For only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That's not a pre-tree of rapture. I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, here's what it is. We are walking like this, and the beast's people are all around us, and he takes them all out and leaves us standing. A thousand shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand by thy right hand, that it shall not come nigh thee. Only Why? Because we have the prayer closet, because we have the secret place. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That kind of goes against the pre-tree of rapture too. Because that scripture wouldn't even be there if there was a pre of rapture because we wouldn't be seeing it. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most, most high, thy habitation. Now what does that mean, habitation? It means that we live in him. Remember the scripture says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it will be given. That's what he's talking about. That's my God. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. What about Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Now what does that mean? That means, Lord, I was holding the steering wheel of my life, going through my life, doing what I wanted to do, and I decided to stop driving my life, stop making decisions for my life, and I decided to do it your way. That means I'm going to pull that steering wheel off, Lord, and I'm going to hand it to you. You're my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, see, let me talk about that for a minute because the average American person that said, Jesus come into my heart, didn't say Jesus come into my heart with the deal saying I'm going to follow the, the teachings, the laws, the commandments, and the precepts of Jesus. They said Jesus come into my heart so they won't go to hell. They didn't make any kind of a deal with the Lord saying I'm going to follow your laws. They're just saying, all right, well, fine, I'll go ahead and pray that little prayer because I don't want to go to hell, just in case. And I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, they do not have God's protection. They may wind up in heaven, but it's going to be after they've gone through a lot of trials and testing. They'll probably have the opportunity to deny Jesus. Now, let's go back to that. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. In other words, he guides my life. I shall not want. Now, that means that he is going to force us to be blessed. <laughs> That's a different kind of a prosperity, isn't it? He maketh, not offereth us, he maketh me to lie down in grace pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, because we say we are a Christian, we follow his laws, he keeps us on the straight and narrow if we'll listen to him, if we have that prayer closet, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now here's the key. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What's he talking about? Well, a shepherd has a rod, and on the end there's a hook. Now the hook is, say the sheep slides down the slippery slope and gets stuck in the mud. And by the way, we do sometimes. We get stuck in the mud, and Jesus has to come along and put that around our neck and pull us out of the ditch. On the other hand, it's also a rod. In other words, sometimes the sheep starts going to the right or going to the left, and that's to tap on the sheep to the right or the left to get the sheep back on the narrow path. In other words, in the prayer closet, one of the things your prayer closet will contain is a time of correction, a time where the Lord is going to speak to you about you. And again, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because of a prayer closet. Because God guides my life. Now, I've thought about making this into a bumper sticker. It says, My prayer closet beats your rapture. <laughs> my prayer closet beats your rapture. And it does, by the way, brothers and sisters. Your rapture is not going to help. I also want to say, before I get into the specific teachings about the prayer closet, praise casts out evil. Because David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Also, we can have our problems disappear from us. I'm going to say this, that if you have family problems, your solution is in the prayer closet. If you have financial problems, your solution is in the prayer closet. If you have personality problems or sin problems, your solution, I'm going to say every solution to every problem can be found in the prayer closet. Whatever is ailing you can be fixed in the prayer closet. Isaiah, or 1 Samuel 17, 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. In other words, David knew that God was going to be there to protect him because he protected him from the lion and from the bear. Now I'm going to show you how you can also know that God is going to protect you in the time of trouble because you're going to also have a track record of experiences of communications with God. So just like David, he knew God. He knew God was going to protect him, and you're going to be able to know that God is going to protect you too. Matthew 6, 9. Here's the specific things that we do in a prayer closet. Then I'm going to talk to you about my prayer closet. Let's say it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now, there are some specific techniques in there that explain what is really going on and what we need to... It's kind of a, an outline of what we do in our prayer closet. And they are worship, praise, correction, protection, worship, and then you wrap up with petition. So let me explain. Worship. When it says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that's worship. So let me first of all give you the definition of worship. Worship is telling God who he is and that you love him for it. Let me say it again. Worship is telling God who he is and that you love him for it. Praise is telling God what he does and that you love him for it. Notice with all of the other dreams and visions where the angel was speaking to Dimitri, praise was not a part of it. What God wants is not more... He wants our praise, but more than He wants our praise, He wants our worship. He wants our heart. He wants our love. And when we have given Him our heart and our love, we can ask what we will, and it will be given. So the first thing is worship. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then the next thing is praise. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So the first thing that we do to make certain that we're in the prayer closet right, we're doing the right things in the prayer closet, is we worship and then we praise. All right, now after we've worshiped and praised, and I'm going to come back and talk about that for a minute, uh, 
But the next thing is a time of correction. You remember that rod and staff? That rod and staff are with me? Okay, this is where we start letting the God, our God correct us because there's things that we're not doing right. Now, the typical American Christian is probably thinking, well, wait a minute, I don't break the Ten Commandments. I mean, I follow them. That's not what I'm talking about. Those should be a given. Those ought to automatically be followed by all Christians. I'm talking about anything short of Christ-likeness. Again, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Also, then, once we've, asked, we've been corrected, then we can ask for his protection. And then we wrap it up with worship, and then finally the last thing we do is then we can file our petitions. In other words, Lord, this is what I'd like. When we've been through this, then we can ask what we will, and it will be given. All right, now let's talk about my prayer closet, what I do, how I got started, and some successes that I believe that I've learned in that prayer closet. First of all, I think it takes a minimum of six months praying a minimum of one time a day. Minimum of one time a day. However, the scriptures say, the, the, the lesson, the example of Daniel was three times a day. So anything less than three times a day in your prayer closet, I can't guarantee God's going to protect you. Because that's how many times Daniel, and he was greatly beloved, and he was protected from the mouth of the lion. Matter of fact, probably in that cave, the lions just kept him warm in the cold cave. Probably one of them was a pillow and the other one was a blanket. He wasn't worried about the lions because he feared God. Anyway, in my particular case, I built a prayer closet. Again, I didn't read a book. I didn't listen to a sermon on it. But God just began to nudge my heart that it was time to build a prayer closet. And I knew Daniel prayed three times a day, so I made a commitment to the Lord. I said, I'm going to pray three times a day also. I was already praying one time a day. And then sometimes, you know, maybe here or there a special prayer. And I thought I was just doing pretty good. I wasn't. So every night when I'd start to go to sleep, this was the ritual. Okay, um, Leslie likes me to scratch her back. It's a, it's a bad habit she picked up from her mother when she was a child. And uh, she didn't warn me about this before I married her. And unfortunately... Uh, uh, it goes along with the territory, you know. So every night, uh, she, she rolls over and demands that I scratch her back. So now, ha having been married for 23 years, my hand is on automatic. It's on cruise control. So that I can, you know, be reading the Bible or watching a DVD or whatever I'm doing at the time. Some speaker wants to come be a speaker for the Prophecy Club. And I'm scratching her back. And then after she goes to sleep, again, I've made this commitment. Matter of fact, I made a vow. The Bible says better for you to not make a vow and, than it is to make a vow and not keep it. And I made a vow to the Lord that I'm going to build a prayer closet. So after I'd scratched her to sleep, then I sneak out of bed and see, I, and I was never going to tell her about my prayer closet, and I sure wasn't going to be talking to anybody about it, and I was never going to put it on the radio, and I certainly wasn't going to be making a DVD about it. It was something personal, something private. I never intended to be talking about this. So I snuck out of bed, you know, got the covers down, just, you know, covered her back up. That way she's asleep. And, and, and I'll go off in the opposite end of the house. Now, in our house at that time, uh, it had a wood floor. And, of course, if anybody got very close, you know, a wood floor, floor you can hear people walking up pretty close, and, you know, from a long way off, and they make creaks in the floor, and you can tell someone's approaching. So I got in the other end of the house, closed the door, and I got down on my knees, and I began to pray. Now, I didn't have the instructions that you've already got and that you're about to get. Again, I didn't read a book about the prayer closet. I just built one. So I got down on my knees. Sometimes I got down on my, my face. And by the way, when I get down on my face, I spread a little blanket out because I don't want to get those dust mites they talk about in the carpet up in my nose. Or in, you know, I don't need any of that. So I spread a little blanket out, and I just get on my face, get on my knees, and sometimes face, knees, face, knees, you know, and, and I, just, I just begin to pray. Now, not knowing what was supposed to go on in a prayer closet, and there's not any real direct uh, instructions in the Bible, at least not that I found then, about how to do it. I just began to pray. Now, it wasn't until later that God began to speak to my heart that it was all laid out in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the Lord's Prayer, as I've already uh, covered. And so... I thought, all right, well, you know, and, and here's, here's what I discovered. I found out that I didn't know God near as well as I thought I did because I didn't have too much to say. 
in the prayer closet. So I got in there and I said, Lord, um, uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, and, you know, and, you know, I just, I, just whatever was coming to mind, I didn't have any structure. I didn't know what I was doing. But I prayed for probably, oh, I'd say at least 45 minutes to an hour, and I just began to do that every night. And, and I began to ask the Lord to show me. And so then I started realizing what worship was. Worship is telling God who he is and that you love him for it. Praise is telling him what he does and that you love him for it. So I would spend probably 10 or 15 minutes in, in worship just telling the Lord uh, how I loved him and how awesome. You know, God, you're holy. You know, you're the God that split the Red Sea. You're the God that created food for three million people, their wives and their children out of thin air. And all of the things about who he is. Now, if you think about it, it didn't... When I started, probably I was into it about 90 seconds and I ran out of something to say to worship God. Because, again, we just, we don't do that much. And I was never led, by the way, to bring in anybody else's music in the prayer closet. And I think that's a real key. So I started worshiping and then I started praising the Lord. And then I would just ask my petitions and I would go on to bed. And I, what I found is that my, my thermometer to find out how close I was to God was whether he would speak to me or not. Because about, oh, probably uh, back in, in 2000, I think it was March of 2000, uh, somewhere in there, God began to speak to me in dreams. And I would get them on occasion. But I noticed that when I got into the prayer closet, I started getting them on a pretty regular basis, like just about every night or every other night. And they weren't always dreams that I'd put on the radio or the magazine or I'd even tell anybody about. Sometimes they were dreams where God was just talking to me. I mean, I just, re recently, I just, uh, I asked the Lord a, a question and um, Leslie and I got on the bed and, we, and I, when we really need an answer, man, I mean, you know, we, we hold hands and we pray together and I, the Lord's never failed to answer us. One of the, he'll speak to one or the other if it's something we really have to know. So when I, when I started in the prayer closet, and I noticed that, that my dreams increased. And, and then what I started doing was asking, I'd already been doing this, I'd ask the Lord a question in my heart. Now, not out loud where the devil could answer it and give me some dream from his demons or something, but only in my heart, because the Bible says that only God can read the heart. So I'd ask the question in my heart, and that night he would give me a dream that answered the question. So I thought, all right, that's good. And then, then I noticed that if I did anything that's less than Christ-like, no dreams. Sometimes no dream for a night or two or three. Sometimes if it was real bad, it was like two weeks before I'd have another dream. Stan, what'd you do that was real bad? <laughs> Nothing like what you're thinking. See, the average person thinking, oh, well, man, you know, he must have broke one of the Ten Commandments or something like that. No, I'm talking about even speaking harshly to someone. Let me give you an example. When I moved to Dallas, the Dallas Morning News began to call us. Now, we got four lines in our home, one for a personal line, one for a fax line, one for home, and then one for Prophecy Club. So we have four lines. So that means we get what? Four times the solicitor calls. Well, most of them are not a problem. But that Dallas Morning News, I mean, even Leslie was complaining about it. Man, they called constantly. Dallas, no, no, please, no. no. You know, first few times, no, thank you, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you. But they don't say, they don't, they don't, they don't know what no is. They have to go on and on and on. And it get really irritating. Uh, by the way, I, I will tell you a little technique that I learned to do. I set the phone down and just walk away. And then, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes later, when the phone starts doing that beeping, then I just hang it up. I figure that's probably the best way to, to handle that situation. That way I don't get upset. But here's the deal. This Dallas Morning News would call, and, and if I would speak harshly to them, if I just say, no, please, no, look, and... No, uh, take me off your list. Don't call me again. You know, I mean, just, just that harshly, no dream. So I'm, I'm in my prayer closet and I'm saying, God, are you telling me I have to get the Dallas Morning News to get a, a dream from you? 
He said, no. He said, you can tell them no. Tell them nicely. Now you're saying, Stan, are you telling me that we have to be that nice to walk with God? You see, here's how it happened. I'm in my prayer closet one night. And this is when the correction began. See, that's the reason I'm saying your solutions to your personality problems, your solutions to your financial problems, your family problems, your children problems, your business problems, whatever your problems are, your solutions are in the prayer closet. So I'm on my knees one night, and I'm praying, and, and the Lord speaks to my heart and says, uh, uh, Stan, I, I'd like to talk to you about something. Well, sure, Lord, what, what would you like to talk to me about? Uh, I'd like to talk to you about you. Okay, well, I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, I've come a long way in the last 10 years, 15 years, hadn't I? Yes, boy, I made a lot of changes, hadn't I? He says, no, I'm not comparing you to you. I'm comparing you to my son. And I thought, oh, I'm in real trouble. Okay, Lord, uh, what would you like to talk to me about? Well, you know how you talked to that lady with the Dallas Morning News this morning? Yes, sir. He said, don't do that. Okay. Are you saying that? That's what I said. What, are you saying I have to, have to buy the Dallas Morning News to get dreams, to get, to get you speaking to me and walking with me? No. You don't have to buy the Dallas Morning News. You just have to be kind to them. But, Lord, I don't even know them. I'll, you know, he's, but I know them. They're my people. Everybody's my people. You have to watch how you talk to everybody, every place. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not walking around. And by the way, if you're thinking, I like a cuss word, well, you can forget about dreams for six months to a year if one of those slips out, something like that. I mean, this is so squeaky clean to, to walk with God and talk with God that I, I don't have a clear way to communicate to you. I mean, I couldn't do anything wrong. And I got to where my prayer closet, and I'm saying, Lord, just one day, just one day, just, just tomorrow, Lord, let me walk through tomorrow being Christ-like all day long. That's all I have, just one day. And Lord, and if I start to do anything wrong, will you remind me? And so I, I'm, you know, I'm pulling out of my car, or I'm pulling out of my driveway, and, uh, and, and I, my lease had expired on the old car, and I had to get a new car, and I had to go run this errand, had an appointment, and Leslie had given me the phone number to call to get the new insurance, and I'm pulling out, and I'm calling, and she's saying, well, look, you know, you've got to call this office, and, and give me the runaround. I said, look, ma'am, I said, can you, can you just tell me? I just need, you just hold me over. We can work out all the paperwork. I said, you know, I already have insurance with you. Can I just give you the name? Can I just get insurance so I know I've got to run this little errand when I get back? You know, and, and I didn't think I was real harsh to her. To me, I was just getting the job done. But then when I got to the prayer closet that night, guess what happened? The Lord began to bring that back. All right, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm, all right, I'll, I won't do that anymore. Now, would you remind me? Remind me if I'm starting to do anything wrong. And, of course, then he'd remind me, and sometimes I'd zip it up. Sometimes I would. Now, brothers and sisters, now, I don't want you to look at Stan on this. This is the level that I'm wrestling with right now. I don't know where you're wrestling with, but I can tell you one thing. You're wrestling with something. There's something that God wants to change in you. See, there's a long list of things that God wants to change in you. And this top thing up here, if you can remove that top thing, then here's what happens. They all rotate up one. And if you can get rid of this next one, they rotate up another one. And you can get rid of this one, it's going to rotate up. There's always things God is going to work with. Here's the thing. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is like Jesus. But that's what he holds us up against. If you want the prayer closet, then that's your goal, to try to become perfect. Knowing you can't, but knowing you have to try. That's the prayer closet. So then, we started, well, it was a long time. This was like probably six, nine months. I mean, every night it was just, all right, I'm going to my prayer closet. Man, if I do anything, you know, by, by some place in here, Leslie, Leslie uh, wakes up in the middle of the night and wants to know where I am. She asks me about it the next morning, and I said, well, I'm just praying. And then for long, the answer kept coming, praying, praying, praying. And 
finally she put two and two together and she's a pretty sharp lady and she said, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, um, I made a commitment to build a prayer closet, which she was real happy about. But then, uh, it's the same thing with Leslie. If there was anything, that mean, like, let me give you an example. One, one time, see, Leslie's a pretty perfect lady. I mean, in my opinion, she's the holiest person I know. Uh, she just doesn't make mistakes very often. And, but one day, I, I really thought she'd made a mistake. And I, saw, I said, now, Lord, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to stand my ground on this one. I said, now, finally, I'm right. I, no, no I'm, I'm right on this. I mean, man, you got to talk to her because I know she's, she's wrong on this one. I know I'm right on this one. I've been waiting a long time for this. I know that I'm right. So she's upset in the other room. So I quickly run over and get on my knees in prayer closet to just make sure. So I say, Lord, Lord, um, what do you want me to do? He says, apologize. I said, but now, now Lord, you saw you, you saw what happened. You know that I'm in the right on this. He said, no, you're not. He said, because you're a leader at home. He said, it's your responsibility to keep your family happy. And if you don't keep your family happy, then we're not walking together. Which then the scripture came to mind about you have to get along with each other. I'm going to show it here in a few minutes. Or your prayers be hindered. So I thought, all right, fine. I'll humble myself again. I'll eat the crow again. So I walk in and I say, honey, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And then everything's fine. And I'm thinking, man, he must hold me to a higher level, a higher standard. And he holds her. And yeah, he says, that's exactly right. He said, because you're the leader of the home. You have to do it right. Everything right. That's what I'm saying. I was... Worshiping the Lord, and then I was praising the Lord, and then I was going through a time of correction, and then at the end, then I would, uh, I would go through my petition, and then I would wrap up with worship. And I noticed that when it seemed like the longer I spent in the worship area, the more frequently I would get dreams. And the more frequently I get my prayers requested, that is, as long as I didn't mess up during the day, I, assuming I was Christ-like all day long, which is pretty hard to do. Um, it's, it's just tough. But if, if you can do that, and I mean that's remain really humble and broken, you know, just like, like uh, uh, Paul says, you know, it, when he prayed and asked for the, uh, the demon to be taken away from him to keep him humble. He said, no. He said, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And that's a real key because to really have a prayer closet, really have a close relationship to the Lord, you've got to be broken. You've got to be humbled. You've got to, uh, I probably should come back and talk about that. Um, that you've got to die to self. And the, the deader Stan got, the more I began to hear God. And the more powerful the dreams were, uh, also during the day, you know, I could, I could ask him a question and I could pretty much know the answer in the still small voice. And then one, ha one night it, it changed and I found a whole new level. I was, again, I was worshiping and then I was praising and then I was corrected and then I would request a wrap up with worship. <clears throat> And one night, I just, you know, you go in there with different attitudes. Sometimes you go in and you're, you're up and you go in to just praise the Lord and thank Him. And then sometimes you go in there with, when you're down and you just want to cry out to the Lord. And, and, uh, and I'll, there's different attitudes. One night, I just walked in and I, I, I just went in my prayer closet. And I said, Lord, you know, I don't want to ask for anything tonight. Um, matter of fact, tonight, Lord, I think all I want to do is just worship you. I just want to tell you how much I love you. And all of a sudden, words just weren't enough. And so I began to just sing to him. Now, I'm not real good at singing, and you probably don't want me to sing. And I'm not real good at remembering the words to songs. Um, but I did my best. And, you know, like I would get in there, and one of them that I seem to always love to sing to him is, I love you, Lord, 
And I lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. I like that one. And another one I like is, You deserve the glory and the honor. And I lift my hands to worship and to praise your holy name. And sometimes I would forget the words. Now, I thought it was, at first, a handicap and a disadvantage. And I thought, all right, fine. I'm just, I'm just going to not worry about the words. I'm just going to sing what really is coming from my heart. What I didn't know is I stepped into a whole new level. And when I began to worship the Lord, not with someone else's words, but with mine. Now, I could borrow their melodies. That's fine. But when I started worshiping the Lord with the words that came from my heart, now, don't get me wrong, sometimes I had to say the words a little bit faster to make them fit the, the, the sentence, you know what I'm saying. But, I mean, I can, I can probably take just about any melody and turn it into a worship song because I just began to worship and just tell the Lord how much I love Him. And when I started doing that, all of a sudden, my dreams increased and I, I really reached a level to where I knew the Lord. And I could tell. I could tell more than anything I had ever done. It pleased him. More than the praise. More than the correction. He loved me to sing to him out of my heart. My words. And so, I mean, I... I, and of course, sometimes he would give me a melody, and so after a while, I'm making up my own songs, and and I'm I'm saying, making up my own words, and you know, me and the Lord just having a good time, just worshiping, and I mean, it would go on like 15, 30 minutes, I don't know, maybe 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 45 minutes, and um, then a lot of times I'd like to walk around out in the backyard and just worship him. Now, I wasn't even on my hands, wasn't on my knees or anything, sometimes sitting down, but just worshiping the Lord, just telling Him how much I love Him. Not thanking Him, not asking Him for anything, just telling Him how much I love Him. And all of a sudden, I noticed that when I ask for something, I got it. Now, let me say, we, I never go into the prayer closet to get let me say it again. I never go into the prayer closet to get something from God. The prayer closet is something, some place that you go to give. It's a place, at least for me, uh, now maybe you don't do a nationwide radio, radio program on, on Bible prophecy and call to warn America, but with me it's a lot of correction. Uh, the correction's kind of slowed down a little bit later as I've, I've been going to get closer to God. And, and I, I'll tell you, I've had a lot of people say that they've seen a lot of changes in me and it's the prayer closet. The prayer closet has made real changes in me. I feel like I know God. I feel like I have a relationship with God like I've never had in my life. Let me give you an example. About, about a year ago now, uh, we had an opportunity to go on a radio station in New York City. It was going to cost us about $15,000 a month to go on this station. We had to have first and last month's radio time up front in order to go on it. That means I had to have $30,000 to say yes to the station. As I recall, this is like about a Tuesday. And uh, I had to let the station know by Friday if I was going to take the time or not. And the problem was, not only did we not have the money, but we were in a hole. And the way ministries go is, is if this is the break and even uh, level right here, it, it's, you know, up a little bit in the black and down in the red. And it seems like you're always struggling. If you're telling the truth out there these days, uh, it seems like you're always struggling, always robbing Peter to pay Paul to get to the end of the month, and there's uh, still bills left. And, uh, but I got on my knees that night, and I raised my hands to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I want New York. And I said, now, I want it really, really, really bad. Because to me, it seems like you can't take the judgment to New York City until you'd at least let me take the warning. Now, maybe they won't receive it, maybe they won't hear it, but at least let me try to take the warning to New York City first. 
I said, now, Lord, you already know we're about $45,000 in the hole. You also know that I have to have about $30,000 minimum uh, up front to say yes to that station. And I said, so I don't know how you're going to do it, but nevertheless, I'm asking you to provide the money so I can take the warning to New York City in Jesus' name. And that night, he spoke to me all night long. It wasn't a dream. I, it wasn't an audible voice. All I know is he did a download, and we had a Bible study. And he took me through 1 Kings chapter 17 and showed me a whole new revelation about what he was really doing there. And essentially, he said this. He said, Stan, you are not an apostolic ministry that starts churches going from city to city to city like Paul starting churches. You are a prophetic ministry likened unto Elijah. And just like Elijah had the authority to ask the widow woman to give up to and including her last meal, you have that authority. Well, that released me because if there's one thing every minister hates to do is take an offering. We hate to ask for money. We hate it. We just wish we could just do our work and the money just come in, you know, like it's really supposed to. But anyway, and, but what he, he released me because he, he gave me authority to ask for money. Then, he went on to say, but when they give their last meal, now I'm also saying you have the authority to pray a supernatural blessing back on them, just like Elijah did for the widow woman to provide for the meal and the oil so it would not fail during the time of trouble. And here's what you can say. And so I, I went on the radio and made a radio program the next day Played that, that one program bought, brought in just a little over $100,000. Enough money, the most successful program we've ever had on the Prophecy Club in 13 years. And by Friday, I said yes to go on to that station. Now, there's more to the story. Now, $15,000 a month, it, it would be really nice if I could tell you in about three months, New York accepted the, the message so much that the response from the radio station there paid the $15,000 a month like it normally happens on most of the radio stations. But unfortunately, it's, it's hard to get Sodom and Gomorrahites to support Christian causes. And instead of bringing in $15,000 a month, more like about $1,500 a month were coming in. So we wound up having to cancel the station. We were on there about six months. We were $40,000 in the hole from the response would come in, everything I figured it all up. And would you believe, about two weeks before we went off the radio station, a lady called up. She says, I'm impressed the Lord to make a $40,000 donation. Almost, if we figured it out exactly, I never figured it out exactly, but probably if we did, probably to the letter, God paid for us to take the warning message to New York City. Now, the other night I was on my knees, and I'm now currently asking to be on radio in... Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, in, in San Francisco, and also Denver, simply because we know that there's an earthquake coming to uh, San Francisco, and uh, I walked around San Francisco, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, wherever my feet touch, I ask you to give me that city, and so we're praying that we'll be able to get on radio in San Francisco, but my point is, I just begin to worship the Lord make up my own melodies, borrow somebody else's melodies, but most important, just whatever is coming out of my heart. I just begin to worship the Lord, singing to Him. So let me summarize. The first thing I think that a person needs to do is make a commitment, or even, if you're strong enough, make a vow. Now, commitments are a little bit easier broken, but you better not break a vow. Make a vow to the Lord to build your prayer closet. And by the way, you don't build it for a few months. It takes a minimum of six months to build it, in my opinion, because there's a lot to learn when you get in there. And yes, don't get me wrong, there's been some times when uh, the prayer closet was maybe only five minutes that night. But there's been other times when it's a lot longer, maybe like an hour or so. I've never prayed all night long, but maybe one of these days that'll happen too. I've never forgotten to pray. Well, let me rephrase it. I forget all the time, but the Lord reminds me. Every night. I don't care whether I get in at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Every night. 
I've, there's been times when my head hit the pillow, and man, it was sinking about three feet deep in that pillow, and I was almost asleep, and all of a sudden, the Lord wakes me up. It's time. All right, well, I go in there and pray. And there's been times when the only way I can keep my, myself awake is to keep my hands in the air while I'm praying. But that's fine. I keep my hands in the air. But I would recommend, first of all, you make a commitment. I think you should get alone where people are not going to interrupt you. I think it has to be a place that you can get on your face, on your hands. Um, you praise with words. You worship with words. Become more Christ-like then I recommend you eventually get to the point to where you're singing worship and praise to Him. I also recommend you do not ever go into the prayer closet to get anything. Never, ever, ever walk in there thinking, all right, boy, I got something. I got a bill we got to fix tonight. No. I always walk. And let me just say, there's something that at least happened to me, and I believe it will happen to you too. Something in my heart is like, there's a love. I just, I've, I've got to go and spend some time with my Lord. I just, you miss it. It's like you miss that closeness, that relationship. And I will even say this. I think that I have, I've learned a lot more about love and what love is. I'm not a real loving person, in my opinion, at least compared to a whole lot of people. I mean, I look at Hayseed Stevens, and Hayseed Stevens walked into a room, and man, I mean, just exuded love, you know? And um, there's another fella here in Topeka. He's a, he's a newscaster, Ralph Hip. I'll say him by name. I mean, he just is a really loving person. And I'm saying, you know, he's a newscaster, and he has more love in his heart than a minister does. And so that's like my big thing that I'm working on is to be able to walk in that love all the time. But it's all possible through the prayer closet. Never go in to get from God, always go in to give. I also think it's important for you to receive the correction of the Lord. Because thy rod and thy staff comfort me. In other words, you, you allow him to chasten you. You understand that the chastening of the Lord is good. Those I love I chasten. And you allow him to correct you. And he will bring things to your mind that you said or you did or you didn't do. Or if you're any place you're not Christ-like, you start building a prayer closet and it will become painfully obvious what you need to work on. I said that right. Painfully obvious. And it's almost like I'll do something during the day and Leslie will say, you know, he's going to get you tonight in the prayer closet. I thought, oh, man, ah, don't say that. I know it. Don't beat me up anymore. <laughs> but let me also say, our God is a good God. He is a God of love, and he knows how to deal with you. He knows when it's time to lay the leather on, and he knows when it's time to pour the love in. And he won't whoop on you too hard. Sometimes it seems like it, uh, but he, he's a good God. Let me give you an example of how God's protect, how God protects. I guess it's probably six, nine months ago. Matter of fact, we were getting ready for a prophecy club meeting right here at the same location. And uh, my daughter came in and she said, Dad, I almost had an accident. I said, what happened? She said, well, I think I was supernaturally protected. She said, something supernatural happened, let me tell you. She said, okay. She said, you know, I had pulled up to the stoplight or to the, to, to the traffic light, the red light. And then there was someone to my right. And then there was someone in the left-hand lane over here. And I looked up in the rearview mirror, and there's a dump truck heading right at me. It's like he's not looking at me. He's not even putting on the brake. And I'm about to get rear-ended bad. And she said, I looked up this way to see if I could maybe run the red light and get out of his way. And she said, but there was an 18-wheeler coming down like this. And what was about to happen? He was about to knock me forward into the oncoming path of the 18-wheeler. And she says, I was about to die. She says, all of a sudden, boom. I'm a block down the road. She said, I, she said, I promise. I never put my car in gear. I never took my foot off the brake, but I'm a block down the road. I was sitting on the side of the road all of a sudden. God supernaturally moved her out of the way. And I can tell you about a similar story with Leslie. She was coming to the office one day. She turned a corner. Her car was going around and around like this because it was about an inch of new fallen snow. She saw that there was a car coming head on. They were about to crash. They both just started hollering, my wife and Leslie and my daughter, started hollering, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. They spun out, 
stopped over in the snow, and they turned around, and the car that was about to hit them was gone. They got to the office. She walked into the office, and one of the other ladies walked out of the office, and she looked down, and she says, there in Leslie's footprints, you know, with the high heels, was another footprint like about 8 inch. well, was about 12 inches long like that. And she says, well, what is Leslie, in, Leslie doing out here uh, barefoot? And she looked down, and she thought, that's too big for Leslie's foot. But there was the only footprints in the new fallen one inch of snow. You can clearly see it. And then she looked, and then you could see the little high heel marks inside the footprint. And she said, Leslie's angel is barefoot. In other words, Leslie had an angel with her. Great big footprint. There it was in the snow. Wish we'd taken a picture of it now. But I just want to let you know that God is capable of protecting. Matter of fact, I want to say something else about that. Keep in mind, our God is the God that fed three million people, their wives, their children, and all of their animals out of thin air for 40 years. Our God caused manna to fall out of the sky to feed people. Our God is the one that fed three million people and their wives and their animals, not only fed them, but also watered them out in the wilderness for 40 years. See, I've seen what they believe is the rock that Moses struck. And it's about 25 foot tall, about square, like a, a dice except for down the middle of it, there's a crack. But up at the top of it, there's a big uh, round hole, you, you might say, between the cracks, about the size of a, a beach ball, and the water didn't come up from the ground to water three million people. It was formed out of th thin air between a crack and the rock. I'm just saying, brothers and sisters, God protecting us is not a problem. It's not a problem. Let me give you another example. Kimberly Jelt is a pastor in Portland, Oregon, I had dinner with one night. She sees visions of the end time. She says this was during the time of the mark of the beast, and she said that every evening they would clasp their hands and they would bow their head in front of an empty plate, and they would say, Lord, thank you for this food which we are about to partake in Jesus' name. They would open their eyes, and the plate was full of food. And she says that's how they ate every day. And I just told that, just uh, Saturday night in Portland, Prophet Tom Deckard was sitting there in the front row, and he said, I've had the same visions. He said, God will supernaturally prepare or pro provide for people in the day of trouble if they have a prayer closet. All right, now, I want to give you a scripture about the words. Second Chronicles 29.30 says, Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princess commanded the Levites to sing... Praise unto the Lord with the words of David. All right, now, how many times in our worship and our praise do we sing someone else's song, someone else's melody? Hopefully we can get to the point to where we are singing, singing our own songs and our own melodies to the Lord. And I believe that if we reach that level, then again, we can ask what we will and it will be given. And the lions, we not, need not fear. The flame, we need not fear. The mark of the beast, we need not fear. What we need to fear is the Lord. Daniel 2, 1, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his sleep, his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call all the Chaldeans, the, the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we shall show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, Ah, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now, why do I read that? I believe that the scriptures are telling us the test. This is the test so that you can know that God is going to be there to protect and to provide for you in the day of trouble. It says, and it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. They sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now notice what Dan Daniel does. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to who? His intercessors. 
his prayer warriors, his buddies, made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his prayer, prayer partners. He says that they would desire the mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. There you go, brothers and sisters. If you'd like to know, if you have a relationship close enough to the Lord so that he will protect you in the days of trouble, there's your test. What you do is the same thing Daniel did. If you can go into your prayer closet, ask a question in your heart, again, not out loud where the devil may hear, and then give you a, a demon dream or something, but only in your heart. If you ask a question in your heart, and you can get God to answer you by a dream or a night vision, then you can rest assured that God is with you to the point that you are going to be protected. However, if you ask repeatedly, I mean for seven, eight, nine, ten days, the same question over and over, and by the way, it's not a flippant question. It's not even a test question, but it's a test, it's a question that you really, really, really need the answer to. And you're fervent with it. If you cannot get an answer, then I think it's safe to say you cannot guarantee, be guaranteed that God is going to protect you in the day of trouble. And I'm just impressed to tell you an example. It doesn't have to be a life-changing question to ask the Lord. Now, when you're full-time in the ministry, every penny that you get, uh, I, I believe that the, the Lord, you have to ask permission to spend that. I mean, there's, there's, there's reasonable uh, things during the day, but I mean, if it's a major expend, expenditure, uh, we always try to ask the Lord and, and make certain we get His permission. Um, so, I, my, my lease was expiring on my car. And I didn't know what to do. And so, I began to look at cars and look at cars and the lease was coming up and I couldn't find a car and there's some other extenuating circumstances. And everybody, I extended the lease. They said I could extend it up to six months. So that gave me another six months to figure out what I was going to do. Finally, and just I was looking around all of these cars. I didn't know what to get. And uh, so I just, I just went on and I prayed. I said, Lord, what, what car can I get? And that night, he showed me a dream of a nice new building that I believe he's going to give us. And someone walked up to me and said, Hey, I understand you got a new car. And I said, in the dream, I said, Yeah. Well, will you come and show it to us? I said, Yeah, sure. I walked out there, and I saw a blue car, a royal blue car. And I thought, man, that's not the car I was thinking of, Lord. I was kind of thinking of a cheaper car. That car? And I even called the office. You remember, I called the office. I told him the dream because, you know, I thought that this is saying the Lord's going to give us an office. And I do believe he is. He's going to give us a nice office building. And... Uh, so I kept looking, kept looking. This is like three months went by, and I ran across a blue, blue car, it just like the one in the dream. And I thought, ah, that's probably just a dream. Maybe that's not the one. And I kept looking, kept looking, and that was the only thing that pulled my trigger. Well, I wound up getting the car, and tonight it sits in our garage. And it gives me a real peace in my heart to know that God told me that I could get that car. It gives me a peace in my heart knowing that I can have my prayers answered like that. Now, here's my, my point, brothers and sisters. If you cannot get an answer, then you have to be really concerned about whether God is going to protect you in the day of trouble. Let me give you a, an example. I guess it was a, probably early 1989. It was the very first dream I ever had from the Lord. And all of my life, I've just almost not had dreams. I just, you know, almost, if I have a dream, it's from God. And this was like the first dream I'd almost ever had in my life, uh, save a few nightmares from watching boogie movies when I was a kid, you know, something like that. I had ordered uh, Jack Van Impe's uh, videotape, and it was, uh, by the way, Prophecy Club didn't start until 1993, so and this was early 90, 1989, and it was uh, something about Russia and America and judgment or something like that. Watched the videotape, and it was just saying more of what Dimitri had already said, and and I, that night I remember just crying and just asking God, you know, surely there's got to be a way we can stop this. There's got to be a way. I mean, I've had my sleepless nights for this nation. I've had my tears for this nation. And I got up early this no next morning and I was driving my son to the airport. 
then I got to thinking, well, you know, maybe I should start, like, storing up food, you know, because I know this stuff is coming. Now, maybe not other people know it's coming, but I know. And then I thought, no, I should just, I should just count on the Lord to protect me. Then I thought, no, no, because the Bible says that if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel, so maybe I should do something about it. Then I thought, no, I'll just trust the Lord. And then I thought, no, I guess it's better to uh, err on the side of precaution. So I thought, all right, I made my decision. i tell you what I'm going to do. When I get home, I'm going to get the checkbook, and I'm going to go down to the grocery store, and I'm going to get me some non-perishable canned goods, and I'm going to start stacking them away in the, in the basement you know, for a rainy day, and I'm going to stack it up. And never mind, I found out later that those things only last about a year or two. The canned goods, they're no good. You've got to have official long-term storage food uh, in, in order to, to get it to last. Anyway, it's got to be packed a certain way. But I was, uh, and, and I actually got the checkbook, and I was headed out the door, but I kind of got sleepy, and I thought, ah, I'm in no hurry. You know, judgment's not going to happen today. So I, I think I'll go ahead and go back to sleep. When I wake up, I'm going to go down, I'm going to get those groceries. So I went back to sleep, and I had this first dream. I dreamed that I was in an airplane. Leslie and I were in an airplane. And uh, it had two rows on this side of the aisle, two rows on that side of the aisle. We're in the back part of the airplane, like the back, the very last seat. And I'm right next to the window, and Leslie's right here. And as the airplane was coming in on its final approach, it kept turning and turning and turning until finally it's like perpendicular to the earth. And then all of a sudden it just stops flying forward and just starts falling down just like that. And I'm looking down like this, and the earth is coming up really fast. And this thought started to come out of my mind. Well, I'll feel a jolt, and I'll be with you in just a minute, Lord. But then I stopped. I said, no. I said, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to protect us. Well, as I'm saying this, Leslie, which is actually on top of me because the orientation of the plane, she's screaming out, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. And apparently the back part of the plane was also Christians. And they're hollering out, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. But apparently the front part of the airplane was not Christians because you could hear them taking the name of the Lord in vain. You could hear them cursing and swearing. Anyway, and so I, I had my eyes closed, and, and all of a sudden I, I opened my eyes, and we weren't falling anymore. Instead, now we're moving forward. The whole front part of the airplane is gone. The wing section forward is missing. I mean, you can see the sky out there. You know, papers are flying around in the, in the, co in the area, in, in the plane there. And there's no cockpit. There's no pilot. There's no wings or anything, but it's flying forward. I look over to the side. I still don't know what this means. But there's a, a glass, black glass building, and I count one, two, three, four, five. We're five, even with five stories up. And I hollered out at the people, we're five stories up. One row up and two seats over, there was a guy next to the window. And he says, we're coming over water. The Lord's going to let us land in the water. And then he stood up and he says, I'm going to go ahead and jump. The guy behind him puts his hand on his shoulder, pushes him down in the chair, and he says, no. The Lord's protecting us. Stay with the plane. And that, about that time, we landed so softly in the water that it didn't even splash. I ran to the front. I put my hand against this boat. There was another boat there. and There's a fellow in a white uniform with a cap, a captain. And I looked up, saw his beady black eyes. And my, you know, my eyes, Our eyes met. And I said, can you help us get to shore? And he went like that, like to say yes. And the dream ended. Now, I didn't open my eyes. And I just said, Lord... Are you speaking to me? Very clearly, I heard five words. I am holding you up. And I thought, what? Then they came back again. I am holding you up. In other words, the I am that I am that has sent thee. That great I am, the consuming fire, the all self-existent one is holding you up. In other words, Stan... If you want to go buy groceries and put it in your basement, you can go buy groceries and put it in your basement, but I am holding you up. In other words, I'm going to protect you in the time of trouble. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have that kind of a dream, you have a carte blanche. You know God is going to protect you. Now, having said that, in 13 years, now, of course, I heard about the, the judgment coming on America in March of 1988. That's when Dimitri came to stay two weeks in my home. And since then... I have not had one bit of trouble. I've not had a car accident, not had any trouble. We've had 
There was a time, now we hold about 14, 15 meetings a month now at Prophecy Club all across America, fly speakers all over. At one time we were holding meetings in 40 cities a month. For 13 years we've been doing that. Out of all of those meetings, not one bit of trouble. There's only been one speaker, one meeting that we physically could not hold because we physically could not get the speaker there because the airline refused to take off because there was so much ice on the, on the uh, runway. Other than that, everything has worked fine through thick and through thin. God has provided. And I just want to let you know, our God is good. Now, I'm, I'm, let, me, let me explain. I mean, our God is good. He's holy. He's perfect. And he is able to provide and to protect but brothers and sisters, what we have got to do is come out of our carnality, come out of the world, come out of our flesh, and we got to get on our knees, get on our face, and we have to find our secret place with the Lord. I cannot tell you exactly how to build your prayer closet. I can tell you how I built mine. But what you've got to do is find out how to build your prayer closet. And if you'll say, Lord, will you show me? I'll make a commitment. I'll, maybe even to the point where I make a vow to where I will, I will form a prayer closet, but I need you to show me what to do. Trust me, he will show you. He's a real God. He blesses, he lifts up, he pulls down, he spanks, he corrects. He's there, he will speak to you. He can and will help you to build that prayer closet. Now, what can prevent God from speaking to us? Well, actually there's a lot. Obviously, if you're breaking any of the Ten Commandments, that's gone. Anything less than Christ-likeness is the real answer, though. And I mean anything less than Christ-likeness. Anything you're doing that might be displeasing God will prohibit Him from speaking to you, walking with you, and thus, whether He's protecting you. To the point to where disharmony in marriage. Anything short of walking in the Spirit, walking in love. Obviously, things like alcohol, tobacco, fornication, you know, all of those things, any of that is out. I mean, you've got to be squeaky, squeaky, white, perfectly clean, as close as possible. I said I was going to give you the scriptures about your prayers being hindered. Here it is. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let me just say this, brothers and sisters. If you're not in harmony with your wife, then you should be really concerned about whether God is going to protect you. And again, the test is, can you ask a question and will God speak to you? By the way, not the still small voice. The test was Daniel got a night vision. So if you can't get a dream or a night vision, and there is a difference, if you can't get a dream or a night vision, if God will not speak to you in the night, that's the official scriptural test, then you cannot be guaranteed that God is going to protect you in the day of trouble. I have a carte blanche. I know he's going to protect me. Now let's talk a little bit about Jesus. I believe that there's a time of trouble, the Bible teaches, such as never was since mankind was created. In other words, we are facing in our lifetime the worst trouble that mankind has seen in some 6,000 years. Matthew 10.32 and 10.33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 39 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I think one of the things that every Christian has to make a decision on now is that they will not deny Jesus, no matter what. No matter how you are tortured, no matter how you're beaten, how you're threatened, you know, one of the things that really gave me a lot of peace, just out of the blue one day, Leslie says to me, Stan, I want to say to you that if there's ever a time where you, you're ever threatened with me or the children, I want you to let us go. We're not yours anyway. We belong to God. And I don't want you to, to be blackmailed in some way over us and the children. And that's been a real comfort to me. See, a long time ago, we made a decision in our family that we were not going to deny Jesus. Dale Carnegie says, ask yourself what's worse, ask yourself what's worse can happen, accept it, and then try to improve on it. What's the worst can happen? 
Well, I guess probably the worst thing could happen would be some kind of unbelievable, ungodly, uh, terrible torture. But right close to that has got to be beheading. And that just happens to be the way the Bible says that the Christians lose their life in the time of trouble. So what's the worst can happen? All right, let's say beheading. I can remember the place in our kitchen to where my wife and I discussed this. We said, oh, what's the worst can happen? I said, well, probably the worst thing that can happen would be if we're standing in line, some guy walks up with a clipboard and says, all right, Mr. Johnson, this is your last opportunity. Either you take the mark or you're going to lose your head. Now, uh, wait. We don't start with you, Mr. Johnson. First, we start with your little two-year-old daughter over here, Leslie Ann. And then we'll go to Bentley. And then we'll go to Sean. And then we'll go to your wife. And then last, we go to you. Now, what's your decision? And I remember us sitting around the kitchen table saying, here's what I'm going to do. At that point, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to face my little daughter in her face and I'm going to say, now, Leslie Ann, I want you to go on over there with them and, and lay down and don't fight them and, and you'll be with Jesus in just a minute and then me and Mommy will be right behind you. Brothers and sisters, that's hard. But let me just tell you, it's a whole lot easier to discuss it now than when you're in the shadow of the guillotine or when you're behind the barbed wire. And I just want to let you know I'm not playing games and neither is God. There's not a rapture, but there is a prayer closet. And that prayer closet will deliver you out of everything. That's what delivered Daniel from the mouth of the lion and that's what will deliver you out of the flame of the furnace. World Net Daily carried this article. A Christian Arab was held ca captive by Al-Qaeda militants in Saudi Arabia and lied to them about his faith and praised their battle against the West to save his life. Nizar Hajazin, if I said that right, one then asked if I was a Christian or a Muslim, he said. I told them we were Muslims and showed him my colleague's Quran as proof. Did that brother just lose his salvation? He denied Jesus so that he could live. See, that's what... Matthew 10, 39 is saying, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. We need to all be prepared to lose our life for Jesus. The Bible says that in the last days, those that Christians, those that are uh, killed for Jesus, one of the ways they're killed is they're beheaded. And the picture you're looking at here is a scimitar. It's used by Masons and, and Muslims, and I personally suspect that that is going to be probably the favorite way that Christians will be killed. Ken Peters made a videotape for the Prophecy Club, I believe it was back in about 1999. Still very, very powerful and still just as relevant today as it was the day it was made. He told about how now about 25, 26 years ago, he had a dream. The dream lasted all night long and that was his call into the office of a prophet and he is a prophet. And he told about how he lived through the tribulation. He said, I began to see these white boxes in everybody's houses. I didn't know white TV sets. I, I didn't know what they were. He said, not until later, until the computers started coming out. He said, I saw buildings that were not erected then that are now erected. He said, I saw that the mark of the beast, matter of fact, on the DVD, it shows how the mark of the beast uh, became implemented, what it looks like. And he said it's, uh, it came on slowly, just like the checks, just like credit cards. They sent them to you in the mail. You began to use them before long. Don't leave home without it. He said, then finally, we started noticing that they were, they seemed to be knowing everything about the Christians. He said, we couldn't figure out how they were knowing everything until we started discovering that when we're watching a TV, just like we watch a TV, the TV can watch back. Well, I've since found inside information that actually that's been true since 1985. Your TV can watch you and hear everything that's in the room. Kind of scary, isn't it? But here's my point. He said, we, uh, he said, I was finally arrested along with some other Christians. He said, we were standing in line. And he said, every once in a while, they would, the line would move up 
And there was different people that would be moving down the line. They kept asking us one question. They refused to say the name Jesus, but they just kept walking up and down the line saying, all you have to do is just deny him. Just deny him. There's plenty of food, there's plenty of shelter. We'll take you out of line. We'll take care of you, get you food and water. All you have to do is deny him. And he said, and the closer we got to our heads being cut off, the more fear, the more people began to shake. And he said, there was a few that stepped out of the line. And he said, I have to tell you, I was really scared myself. And he said, when I got up to where I was only about three away, and he said, by this time, there'd been several step out of line. He said, first, they laid my wife up. He said, and they just, they laid us not face down, but face up. And he said, it wasn't a guillotine. It was that scimitar, that long knife like you see the masons use. And he said, the guy just went whack like that. And he said, as I was standing in line, he says, I started shaking uncontrollably. And he said, I didn't want to deny Jesus, but I was so scared. He said, I was just shaking like this. He said, all of a sudden, I felt a hand on my shoulder. He said, I turned, and he says, I saw a man standing there. And he had nail scars in his hands. Somehow, I knew it was Jesus. He was very tall. And he said, don't fear them taking because they don't fear them taking your life because death can't hold you. And he said, and peace flooded my soul. He said, I walked up there without fighting. They didn't have to tie me down. And he said, the instant that blade touched my skin, it never even cut me. He said, the instant it touched my skin, just like that, it was gone. I never felt anything, but the blade touched my skin. And, of course, that kind of rings true because I remember reading some of the stories in Fox's Books of Martyrs about how Christians were burned at the stake and they were raising their hands and praising the Lord. They never felt a thing. I just want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, most important, don't deny Jesus. No matter what, don't deny him. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the tortures of the beings are, don't deny Jesus. But I also believe if you have a prayer closet, I think I've read enough scriptures, enough testimonies and dreams and visions here. If you have a prayer closet, I believe God will protect you and you will not have to go through that testing. The testing, brothers and sisters, are for the backslidden ones that just don't have the relationship and they have to be tested to get the spots and wrinkles off. Revelation 13, 15 says, as many as would not worship, hear the key word worship, the image of the beast should be killed. You see, what Satan wants is for you to worship him. What God wants is for you to worship him. Key word, brothers and sisters, is worship, not praise. He wants our heart. He wants our love. Revelation 24 says that they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. Worship is the key. Revelation 14, 9, if any man worship the beast... Hear the word again. Worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they had no rest day or night who worshipped the beast and his image. And whosoever received the mark of his name, here's the patience of the saints. They're not gone. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, we're not gone, and the faith of Jesus. The question, brothers and sisters, is who do we worship? Matthew 10, 39 and 10, 28 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy the body and the soul in hell. Here's our question of the evening. Who will get protection? Those that accept Jesus? I don't think so. Filled with the Spirit? Attending church? Maybe church leadership? Pastor? Praise and worship leader? How about those that know the Bible really, really well? Memorize lots and lots of verses? No. How about those that sing in church? How about those that teach Sunday school or preachers? No. I think it's the ones that have a personal worship time, a personal relationship. What does stop sinning? and repent mean. 
Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What he wants us to do is to say, You know, God, I'm going to choose your way. Not the way of the world. Not the way of the devil. Not my way. I'm giving you my steering wheel. I'm going to do it your way. But in order to do that, we have to realize we've sinned. Before we were born, we were sinners, the Bible says. The next thing we have to realize is that we cannot earn our salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we cannot earn it. Salvation is a free gift. If I were to say to anyone here, say, Well, I'll tell you what, if you'll sit here and listen to me talk here for just five minutes more, I'll give you this computer, this little laptop. Would that be a gift? No, that's a wage. You had to do something for it. If I were to say, uh, tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll give you this little laptop here for a nickel. Is that a gift? No, that's a bargain. If I were to say, tell you what, come on up here and you can have this laptop. Well, for what? No, just come on up here, I'll give the laptop to you. That's a gift. See, that's the way it is with Jesus. Every day of our lives, he is holding that opportunity out for us. He's offering us free salvation. But what do we have to do to get it? That's a good question. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, it's not enough to say, Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus and not really believe it in your heart. And it's not enough to believe it in your heart and not really say it. And I'll even add this. It's not enough to say it, to walk it, and then to deny it. It is not enough. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But what does repent mean? All right, here's repent. In my life, I was walking through life, doing what I wanted to do, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came knocking and said, Stan, you know, you're a sinner, and you need a Savior. So I said, all right, Jesus coming to my heart. I got water dunked, and then, here, here, watch this, here's a repent, and then I turned around. Now, in my life, that was nine years old, and then nine years old, ten years old, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then I got married, to someone that said she was a Christian, but wasn't, talked me out of going to Sunday school, and guess what happened? Taught me out of going to church, and Stan started going back, away from God. And then God arranged for me to get in a royal pinch to find out how much I needed him, to show me where I was, and that's what's coming on all the world. And then I said, you know, Lord, I'm really sorry. I'm going to get back to you. And I sat down, and I prayed, and I said, Jesus, I made a mess of my life. But if you'll forgive me, if you'll give me another chance, I promise from here on out, two things. I will read your Bible, and I will follow your Bible. And my life changed. And from then on, I'm a different person. Brothers and sisters, that's what we have to do. We have to make a decision. It's not enough to say, Jesus, come into my heart. Matthew 7.21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven but those that doeth the will of the Father. He says that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If thou will enter into life, keep my commandments. And hereby we do know that we love him if we keep his commandments. If we do not keep the commandments of Jesus, he is going to cast us into hellfire, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, someplace we don't really want to go. Now, let me do this. First of all, I'm going to pray the prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody in here to say it again, even though you probably already said it, because of the benefit of the DVD out there. But then, I'm also going to pray about the prayer closet. So first, if you haven't received Jesus, you need to pray this prayer to receive Jesus. So let's pray it. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father. I receive His blood to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, to keep me holy, 
and to save me the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now I believe that there's a lot of people on DVD, also some people even here in our audience here, that would like to make a commitment to build a prayer closet. I'm not asking for a vow that needs to be between you and God because if you make a vow, you need to keep it. But let me say, the prayer closet is not something you do for five days, five months, or five years. The prayer closet is something you're saying, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Now, in my case, I pray in the morning, and then I pray in the evening. I pray twice a day. If I get another chance, I'll pray during the day, but I always pray morning and evening, morning and evening. That's a prayer closet. But to get scriptural guarantee, it's supposed to even be three times a day. So if you'd like for me to pray for you to receive revelation knowledge, for God to help you to build your prayer closet, what I'm going to ask you to do is just pray with me. All right? Dear Heavenly Father, these people, either on DVD or here in the audience, that are praying with me have made a decision to build a prayer closet. And Lord, there's only one person that can show us how to build that prayer closet, and that's you. And Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would supernaturally call them into the prayer closet, call them into a close relationship with you, show them how to build it, show them the things that they need to change, show them how to worship you, how to praise you, show them how to hear your voice, how to be corrected, show them how to be more Christ-like, and Lord, show them how to have a relationship close enough so that in the day of trouble, they need not fear. You'll be there to provide and to protect. In Jesus' name, amen.